Um, so today's event, it's very special because it's a culmination of projects our peer mentors and ambassadors have been working for over a year, all right? And uh, just to give a quick background, the peer mentor program was created two years ago to assist FYE students because we realized that we had a lot of support from our faculty and staff. We had counselors, specialists, you know, administrators, outreach that was supporting our FYE students. Uh, but when it came down to asking those hard questions, our students were still asking each other. Even those questions were so critical as financial aid, right? Choosing classes. So even though we established that connection with our students, they still would go to each other. So with that in mind, so I talked to Tadeo and other administrators, and we came up with this program that was going to support our students from the peer perspective. So we started with 22 peer mentors two years ago. This year, we have an awesome group of peer mentors that you'll get to meet right now. And so it's interesting that, you know, that they're, um, their activities that they've been creating, it's, they have been done with uh, working with the students in mind. And it's interesting how other projects have something really, really uh, personal to them. And I'm just excited to be here. And um, I'll just pass to my colleague. Okay. All righty. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about, so in addition to their um, projects. The peer mentors have also been involved, as many of you know, with other initiatives on campus as well, like helping um, administer the SESI with research, um, helping with events like Welcome Day, helping, um, you know, serving on student panels for the FYE summer experience, and also coordinating some of the FYE monthly meetings. So they've had a lot of other responsibilities too, in addition to their projects. And one thing I hope that you um, get from when you listen to their presentations is the passion and the connection that they, that they have to their project. So each of them picked it because it had a meaningful connection to themselves. So I hope that comes across in their presentations as well. And we're really happy to have all of you here. Hi, everyone. Um, so the way that this, pre this whole presentation is going to work, each of our mentors have um, 10 minutes to present. Um, and we'll each have uh, five minutes to ask our questions. So please hold your questions till the end. Um, we'd also like to let you know that um, the applications for the peer mentors and the ambassador positions are currently open. So if you know of any students who you think would fit the position, we highly encourage you to uh, ask them to apply. You can find our information on the peer mentor website and the student ambassador website. Um, we're really hoping to get things started in the summer so we can really get some good connections between our up new upcoming mentors and ambassadors to really support our students. Thank you. We'd like to thank everyone for coming out today and just showing your support and seeing what uh, our service projects are about. And today we're going to present on Homes for Hawks, which is the name of our service project. And you'll see today that the service projects being presented cater to a certain demographic of students here. And the demographic of students that our project caters to is for students facing housing insecurities. My name is Jonathan Leong. Melissa Blakes. Brian Mai. And we'll be presenting Homes for Hawks today. So our project addresses one of the basic needs in securities here on campus. And just before I get into it, I just want to offer a caveat to you guys. We put in a lot of work into this project. And because of the limit on time, we can't really present everything and all of our findings to you guys. And you could reference our website, or Oscar will be passing out the packets that we've been working on throughout the year. And you guys can look for more information on there. So in our packet and in our research, we define basic needs insecurities as students who are facing food, shelter, housing, and clothing insecurities. And we found that on campus, it's not just housing insecurities that students are facing, but those same students are also facing food insecurities and clothing insecurities. And that is why we partnered up with some of the service projects that I have up here. We partnered up with Hawkspot Food Pantry and Hawkswap uh, Clothing Project. And, <clears throat> and we're trying to address the same demographic of students, kind of like a one-stop shop for students to get the same service. 
instead of referencing students to visit other areas for a resource, we want to streamline that effort to cater to one need. And so again, that is our vision as Homes for Hawks and as this basic needs initiative is to combine our efforts to address the same demographics of students. So today we're gonna talk about the problem that we've identified on campus when it comes to housing and security. And then we're gonna talk about the legislation that addresses those insecurities. And then we're also, we're also gonna talk about what other campuses are doing to address that issue as well. And then we'll finish off with um, a survey. We would like to show you guys a survey that we did on campus, as well as some of our proposed recommendations to um, alleviate and address this issue on campus. So I'm gonna transition over to Militia. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, my name is Militia, and we did the research. We, I don't know if this is, can you hear this? Okay, so um, I accessed this in 2016. I was looking for a room to rent, and I was looking on campus to see if they had any resources. And what I found was, I found this list, which was on the website, and what I want you guys to pay attention to is this right here. Um, this was in 2016, I started calling these people, I started asking questions about their room. Some people told me, yeah, we rented that room out a couple years ago. Some people were like, oh, you got the wrong phone number. and um, so what ended up happening is I realized that this, this date right here in 2016, this was still on the website in 2000, which was, these were available in 2014, and this was still on the website in 2015, I mean 16. And so this is what it looked like up until yesterday. So this was our website that, that had came up, and, when, and exactly how this is showing is exactly how it showed up on the website. So as soon as you click in housing, this is what will come up. And again, we still have this, this here on the list. This is where, this is still on the website. And if you look at the highlighted parts, if you can read it for like a couple seconds and see what it says, we, we uh, had an issue with this because it's kind of more of a liability. You know, somebody was promising that um, if you call some, some places, the school, they'll give you, if you let them know you're a CRC student, they'll give you some type of discount. Right? And then it says there's these apartments. So we wondered what apartments were you talking about? Were you talking about these apartments? Because these are on the list as well. And if you look at this list, you can see that there's 800 numbers on this list. These apartments are in the Thomas. Then there's another one, I think, on Kiefer Boulevard. So we were just like, how, like what kind of sense does this make? Right? And um, what we wanted to do originally was update the website. So when, what ended up happening is we went to talk to somebody in the research department, and when we talked to the person in the research department, like, updating the website became obsolete. He started telling us about homeless students, and he, and he brought us to the legislation. And when he told us about the legislation, it piqued my interest. So I started doing some research. Um, as we speak, this is to the extent of two weeks ago, I researched all the way up until two weeks, but some of these bills are changing. However, I did point out these two, one, these two bills because these are happening right now. And this 568, it's uh, Rapid Rehousing for College Students. It's a pretty interesting bill because it spells out exactly how that program is going to work. So if the school wanted to implement that program, they can get on the website, they can read it, they can see what they need to do. Um, it's been introduced. I don't know what it takes to go, to go through to law, but I know that it was introduced in February. So that was very recent. This parking of homeless students, so we see, I saw that. And, and that is also a little problematic because what they want to do is they want to park students in a parking lot, in a car, but I, what about the students that don't have a car? Can they put a tent in the parking lot? Or what about the students that can't pay their fees? It says you need to have your fees paid, you need to have this, you need to have that. I don't know anybody that live in a car that can do all that. So I, I would like for the school to go a little bit further. Are we going to connect these people to services? I mean, this is a great step in the right direction, but it's not a solution. So we would like for them to, I've seen, what, we, we'd, we'd like for the school to go further, but I've also seen on the legislative website that they've started making changes to that um, bill. It started being amended, the wording is being changed. So here are some of the efforts of the other colleges. Um, what I found interesting about this is that this is Berkeley City College. Not a lot of people know that Berkeley has a city college, 
right? UCs, you know, it's, it's huge there, and so people talk a lot about that. However, this is what I found on the Berkeley City College website, right? And so this is, is sort of like a co-op. And the important thing about this is that they have a central office. They have, sorry about that, see I can't do this. Okay, there we go. So they have a central office that's on campus where, where people, where students can actually go to and uh, access some of these resources. On here they have a map. And I felt like if they can do this at their college, we can do this, we can do this at our colleges. And the map, it shows different houses. You can't, it's hard to read, but there's, they have like themes. They have like the African-American theme house, um, Kona, Zimbabwe. So they have a bunch of different themes for their houses. And what I think happened is that they, they went out and did what we wanted to do, which, which was go canvassing. Because this is a community college, right? We wanted to canvass our community and see if some people would be willing to rent to our students. This is our sister college, right? And I, I, I put this up here because this is important. If they can do this at their college, we should be able to do this here at our college. I, I put it there because they have something where students can go and they can read and they can, they can see some type of list that addresses housing. Also on their website, and you can't see this, it doesn't show up well, but they do have a disclaimer the college assumes no responsibility for this on-campus housing other than providing the listing of available housing. Simple. That's really simple. And so we thought maybe that, that's something that CRC can do. And then the tiny homes. We went to a hearing down at the, um, at the Capitol, and they talked about tiny homes that they have on a college campus in L.A. Now, I thought that would be a great idea for us because we have a construction department which can build these homes. Um, maybe we can promote that program by having, you know, students participate in it. We can, we can um, grow it. You know, I, I thought of all kinds of different avenues that we can go down with that. And so Sierra College is right down the street. I don't know what the logistics are, and I don't know how it all works, but I think, you know, they have dorms, and that's a community college. So I don't think it's too out of the question for us to even propose that. So I'll pass it along to Brian, who did our um, surveys. In addition to our research on legislature, as well as the services provided yeah. by other colleges, we also looked into our, um, our on-campus research with a con by conducting a series of surveys to better understand our student demographic as well as the student sentiment towards our housing resources on campus. Uh, we conducted the surveys at various events and activities throughout the campus semester last year, as well as just during passing period, at both our main campus as well as the Elko Center to get a bigger sample size of students, as well as a wider range of input. And uh, for time's sake, I'll very briefly go over some of our survey results from 500 students. Here we can see that most students uh, said that they lived at home with their family when asked about the current housing situation. Around 25% of them rent apartments or housing, but a large majority, over half of them saying yes, and over a quarter considering moving out. So we know that a lot of students are looking with the intentions of moving out in the near future. <clears throat> At, as Militia said before, earlier our project had different goals. One of our main goals was helping students find shared housing so they could split the difference of rent and make it a little bit more uh, financially accessible. Here we can see that 70% of students almost said that they would rather have roommates than live alone. A lot of students expressed concerns about financial stability and whether they should take a lease or rent out by themselves. And we can see that of those 70%, 60% said that they'd be willing to rent with CRC students as a more um, stable means of finding other people. Uh, in addition to asking for rent, we also looked into their monthly income. We can see here that most students work around 26 to 35 hours a week, uh, on average from a moderate part-time job to a full-time job, as well as on average making $1,000 to $1,500 a month. And with that $1,000 to $1,500 uh, $1, a month in mind, we can see that most students av on average pay around six to $800 in rent a month. Uh, with our averages, we can see that about half of their monthly income goes directly toward housing expenses, with the rest being for food, gas, and other necessities. And we also probed the students to see how much they'd be willing to pay for rent. Uh, a lot of students said that the four the 800 range was moderate for them, which is to be expected, but from the housing list and apartment list that we saw earlier, it's severely under what apartments are asking of students. 
And in addition to asking about their financial uh, situations, we also saw how many units were a student, was a student taking. Around 55% of our students reported that they took seven to 12 units, which is just barely making full time or right under it. And only 26% uh, reported they made 13 to 18 units that semester, with 15 being a full unit course load recognized by the college. We can see here that a lot of students did in fact have to drop some units, take less classes throughout the semester, as they said, for, to um, pay for housing, for other um, emergencies and situations that came up in their life. We can expect students to wor uh, work full, full time when on average a 15 to 12 unit course load, they would have to work just as much during the week, as much as time they spent in school. And one of the final um, questions that we asked them was if they had any difficulties or would like further assistance with finding housing resources on campus. And over 75% of students said yes. As you can see, with this large majority of students, it's a very clear-cut problem that CRC has a housing uh, problem. And I'm going to pass it off to John to propose our recommendations to alleviate this problem. OK, because of the sake of time, um, I'm just going to go briefly, quickly through our recommendations. But you can view a more in-depth um, report on these recommendations in the packets. And you can ask for it towards the end of the presentation. And you can also check on our website as well. And we'll provide you a, a link for that at the end of our presentation. So we've identified six key areas as part of the uh, recommended proposals to address this housing concern of students on campus. And you could read that in the, the packet as well as to how we detail and outline those proposals. As of what we can do immediately to alleviate this problem is Number one is a complete overhaul of the website. And again, that's one of the six key areas is information, how we disseminate that information to students. And the second area is we would like to be established as a housing resource on campus. And we will um, prepare the processes for how that would look like as well. And in accordance with Assembly Bill 302, we would like to immediately take action on that bill and provide um, safe parking spots to students who are facing homelessness. And number four, again, is that collaborative network that we want to form with, and we have already formed with Hawkspot and Hawkswap, which we'll later present today as well, on the basic needs and insecurities of students. So this is the end of our presentation. If you would like to keep in contact with us, we have our um, contact information uh, in front of you guys, and you can take a minute to write that down or take a picture. And we thank you for your time. Uh, yeah, it's in the program as well too. So thank you everyone, thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Sonia. And we're going to be presenting our Hawk Swap Clothing Exchange. Um, hi, my name is Catherine. And we did have a third member, Felicia, but she could not be here today. So um, on average, we just want to start out with some statistics. So on average, Americans spend around $1,100 per year on just clothing itself. And students nationally spend around $5 billion a year. And we're here to reduce that cost to zero. So this is our mission statement. Like Jonathan was saying, we are collaborating with two other groups on campus to form a, an entire basic needs initiative. So to expand on that, I'm going to read the mission statement to you guys. Uh, the Hawk Swap is one branch in a collaborative effort to help provide basic necessities to our students in need. Partnered with the Hawk Spot and Home for Hawks, our three projects aim to provide food, clothing, and shelter to students facing basic needs and securities. The Hawk Swap focuses on providing access to new or gently used clothing on campus to students in need. So oh, the overall objective of our project, so the first thing is um, to provide access to free clothing uh, for the students. We don't have a charge for these kind of clothing. They're all donations. And we work on a point-based trade system that I'll elaborate on later. So our demographics, we're currently only serving CRC students, but in the future we are looking to expand this to our sister colleges. And most of the students who are coming in are low income. And 38% of California residents were poor or near poor in 2016. And if that was representative, it would be one in three of us here today. 
So this is the point system that we were talking about, and this was created to avoid an abuse of the system. Since all of these clothes are given out for free, we had to find a way to limit it so that we always have clothes to give away. Now expanding on the point-based trade system, so we do um, give students every week five points. Uh, those refresh at the end of every week. Um, and so those uh, five points, as you can see, the clothing is all based on different amounts of points, and so students can use those five points however they wish to do so. So they can get like a jacket or then like a collar shirt, and then that would be like five points. Um, and we also do this because uh, we want to balance out the amount of clothing that comes in and comes out. And there is students on campus that will just come and bring a ton of donations, and that balances out with the students that are not able to donate. Um, and so we have this um, kind of system that's been working for us to keep a track of uh, the amount of clothing that we have. So this is some of our promotion. You might have seen these flyers around campus. And if you look at the first two, it says that our times are Mondays and Tuesdays from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. And that is in conjunction with the Hawkspot Food Pantry, the time and days that that is open. And it is also in the same place so that the students who are already coming in to get food will see that now we also offer clothing since we serve a similar demographic. And so we do have social media accounts uh, also to promote this service. And we did partner up with, um, uh, we had some pictures taken from Danny Wiest. Uh, and so these are some of the, one of the pictures that we had. And then we had like our flyers that we, um, hopefully you've seen around campus. So currently we have around a thousand items that were all donated and we're currently storing them in Shed One on campus. Um, so we did try to partner up uh, with other groups like Home for Hawks and the Hawk Spot because eventually we all want to be under the same roof. Um, yeah. And on March 4th, just a little over a month ago, is actually when we opened and had our first event. And ever since then, we have an average of about 20 students who actually leave with new clothes. And so this was um, the first event that we had. So you'll see that there's only one clothing rack. We only had one at the time, and it was um, one that we got borrowed. And then we do have the clothing, as you can see, on the table. And then we also had it in boxes. Uh, I will say it's not the most convenient way for students to be searching for clothing. And like it's not as the most organized way it could be, but it was working for a lot of the students. And um, it, it still makes the system work for us. But eventually, we want to change that. So this is our demographics and feedback. Um, on students' first visit, we do ask them to fill out an intake form just so we can see who we are serving. And we actually found that about half of our students' income is $1,000 or less per month. So we were able to partner up with Institutional Effectiveness, and we got the help of Paul Mind uh, to create this kind of like survey that we gave students. Um, and it was based on a one to five scale. And the first one you'll see is how helpful the hawk swap was for them. So five being extremely helpful. And as you can see, all the students that did do the survey, they all said five. So it was really helpful for them. And then on the bottom one is how likely they are to come back. And number five being very likely, all the students were willing to say that they want to come back for this. So this is just a couple more of the things that we got for feedback. 100% um, said that they would recommend this to a friend, and 32% of them have children, and we are also accepting children's clothes. So also part of the feedback that we got from students uh, throughout the surveys was a central theme that we see from everyone, well, all the students, is basically get a space. So we, as we mentioned, we are in front of uh, where the hawk spot is, but it's not really a room itself to put all the clothing that we have. There is so many stored in the shed that it's kind of too hard right now to just put all the thousand clo um, clothing items out there. So they want to have a space where they can get all those basic needs and securities and uh, met and be able to come in and like see all the clothing. All right, so moving forward, our main goal right now would um, if possible to really get that space, it would be awesome for a student to come in and um, get the, that kind of clothing and take it home and then also have more space for donations because we do want to still have students come in and bring donations. We don't want them to just stop bringing donations. Um, we still have like students that will continuously come to bring donations and like, oh, I, I found this. Let me bring this to donate. So we don't want to stop that. 
and eventually create something like a theme day. So like maybe have uh, an interview day where students can come out and bring like formal clothing or a Halloween theme day where students will bring like their previous costumes and so forth. So we've pretty much already done everything to get this program started. We've collected 1,000 donations. We've perm or implemented a schedule, bi-weekly schedule, that we now have regular students coming every week. And I think they would be very disappointed to find out that this program won't be able to move forward due to a lack of space, because as it is right now, it is very inconvenient for us to go to the shed every week and not even be able to display all the items that we have. So we would like to partner with the other two basic needs initiatives group and not just ask for support for our project, but to support all three of these projects under one roof. And I think that would be a, a very good use of space on campus. And we would just like to say thank you to everybody who's helped us along the way. Yes, and thank you everyone who's present here today. We really hope to collaborate in the future and make these projects bigger than what they are now. All right, hi, we're the third of the three branches of basic necessities for helping students. And I'm just gonna break down today for you guys. We're first gonna talk about our background and how the Hawkspot all started. And then the Hawkspot was actually already established when we began our service project with the Hawkspot. So we're gonna talk about sort of what we started with and how it's developed. And then we're gonna talk about some data that we've gotten over the time that we've had the Hawkspot and previous data that the Hawkspot already had, as well as solutions we have found for students based on that data and what we hope to accomplish in the near future. Hi, I'm Medlin. Hi, I'm Jim. Hi, and uh, and my I mean and my uh, uh, and my name is Frederick Mandy. Uh, I'm also gonna I mean I'm, I'm I mean I'm also gonna introduce uh, Angel who's not here, and also uh, thank uh, Jennifer and Jordan who helped us in this project. So uh, uh, for the background, uh, the Oxford started uh, uh, with Diana, uh, who was a former ambassador. Uh, and Kayla Marie and and uh, and Kelly Milan. So, so the idea came from the fact that one day Diana was sitting uh, in the quad, and one student came to her asking uh, if she could, I uh, mean, uh, like if she knew uh, somewhere where uh, they could find food. And Diana, uh, at that time, said that she did not know. And after one last student left, she kind of uh, took some time to think over, and she came up with the idea of making, I mean, of of, of me making a uh, the Oxford. So uh, Diana, with the three students, they decided to, I mean, to do some research and contact some, uh, I mean, some faculty, and they came up with the idea of the Oxford. And in 2016, the Oxford officially, uh, uh, I mean, uh, officially uh, opened. And when we opened, we used to work. Uh, I mean, uh, we used to have it uh, uh, open uh, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Friday. To I mean, two, uh, two to four p.m. and uh, the. And the processes was like students will come for the first time. They'll, uh, they'll, I mean, they'll, they'll use uh, like an intake form to call. I mean, uh, to fill some information that we're gonna collect, and then they will, and then they will, I mean, and then they will make uh, like a bag for themselves. But with time, we noticed that our, uh, that process, ha I mean, had some issues. Uh, uh, where since we're open from two to four p.m. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, like on this chart that we got from Paul from. Uh, from f from institutional uh, like effectiveness, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, two I mean two I mean two to four p.m. is not the best time to have students come and get their food, and the best time are actually um, uh, like ten to eleven uh, or twelve to one or one to I mean uh, one one and, and one one to two p.m. So that's why we decided to change um, the time from twelve to two p.m. so we can be able to serve more students, but. With serving more students came, uh, I mean, came, I mean, came more problem where we, we were not able to serve everybody. We will run out of food in just one day of serving the student. So um, uh, did, uh, this is a graph that shows uh, how many students have been coming since we opened the Oxford. Uh, the black line that's at the bottom, uh, uh, as you can see, that was in 2007, uh, in 2017, and that used to be when the Oxford uh, was open from 2 to 4 p.m. And when we changed this in 2018 from 12 to 2 p.m., 
uh, we see like an increase. And with the projection uh, of, of 2019, are we going to get more students? But still, we're going to need space to store all this food because we, we run out of food just in one day. So based on the information that Freddie gave, we noticed that our systems needed to be changed before we had a student intake form that was a paper version. And given that it was on paper, we would have to manually input it into our database, which was a USB drive. So we thought it would be best to change to a Google form that students could fill it out through at their home or if they needed to use the computer labs, and that would be fine. And doing this also came in handy because it automatically gave us charts that we can reference to see students' demographics. So based on these graphs, we can see that students have completed, on average, uh, roughly 0 to 30 units, meaning that they're fairly new to CRC. And we wanted to sort of expand that demographic to have an even playing field where we're not only getting incoming students to CRC, but we want to get those who have already been here and maybe no, don't know of the resource that's available. And we also noticed that most of the students are taking 7 to 12 units, which means that they're taking roughly 2 to 3 classes, if not more. And that means that their time's very limited, so that's why we changed to making pre-made bags because it would be a grab-and-go situation where they didn't have to waste any time. And more information that we found was that students' income was zero for almost half of the population that we serve, and the average was around $711 with 22 cents. And those students had, on average, a four-person household. Now, imagine having to feed four people and with only a budget of $700 if you couldn't have any other resources. So this is a resource that's very important to many students who face these basic needs and necessities. So with the, all the changes that were happening this semester and last semester, we thought it would be best to create a new flyer so that students can see that not only our time changed, but we expanded to Wednesdays to have appointments so that if students didn't meet that two hour time slot, which is already limited, that they could just email us and we could schedule an appointment that would only not only be on Wednesdays, but they can make it a weekly appointment so that it can happen all year round. And then on the right, you'll see that we had a Giving Tuesday last semester, which helped raise more than $2,000 for the Hawk Spot. And this was very important because it was an extra amount of money for when we were low on supplies and we needed to make emergency uh, runs to other stores to make sure that we always had food for students because we did have some situations last semester where we had to say, I'm sorry, but we don't have any food to give you, which is the last thing I think anyone wants to do. Besides the result, we also got food from Arrow Food Bank, and we also got food from uh, CRC Office Photography, and some as well as the donation from fac faculty and students at CRC. And with the food that we got, we sent some to VRC, and we sent to English scholar. And even though we have some resources of food, but sometimes we grant our food and we don't have enough food to give to students. So this semester we went to Winco to shop twice, and the first time we spent more than six hundred dollars. And um, with Jordan, me, and Madeline, we went to Winco, and three people we had to shop for four cars of food. And the second time, we increased the food that we shop. We shop more than $900. And we shop for seven cars with also that three, those three people. And for one year that we continue uh, on the hotspot, we changed the hotspot. And we got more items, more new items for students, such as peanut butter or bread. That's more convenient for students. And as you see on the picture, is the whole hotspot. And because we, uh, we are using all the space in, in the hotspot, but we still rent our food because the space, is too, like, the space is so small that we, when we get food, and we store that for two weeks. So after one day, we rent. We ran our food and we cannot serve for students. As Madeline mentioned earlier, sometimes we have to say sorry to students because um, say sorry to students because we ran our food. And we don't want to stop here. We want to develop the hotspot up to the next level. We want to switch the canned food 
to fresh fruit, such as vegetable and fruit. And after after one after one year, we did change the hours to fit more to get more students with the hotspot, and we also remake the bag to save time for students and also save labor. And we also create a Gmail, which is more convenient for students that who cannot come to the hotspot at the time that we open. And we did a promotion to get more students. And we also held some events that to get more donation. And right now, what we need is, is we want to get more space and more funding. And here's, here's the hotspot at the, at UC Avai. This, this also our vision. We want our hotspot in the future is, will be like that. And thank you for, for your being here and, and your attention. So good afternoon, my name is Abby Gilneria. I'm Mega Kana. And today we'll be introducing you our project called Take It Easy. Now before we begin, we would like everyone to participate in a small interactive activity. This will be a guided meditation, just a few minutes of your time. So can I ask everyone to please close your eyes for a bit? Go ahead and take a deep breath, inhale. And exhale. I want you to take a minute and think about how has this week been for you? <laughs> Do some of you feel stressed? Anxious? A little bit overwhelmed? Have you gotten the chance to ask yourself, am I doing okay? Is there a lot of workload that's on your mind, on your plate, that you want to just forget about right now? Go ahead and do that. Now let's go ahead and start thinking of something that's happy in our life. Yes, it could be spring break. <laughs> it could be someone special in your life, whether it be a significant other, a family member, Maybe even your pets. Okay, once again, let's go ahead and inhale one more time. And exhale. Okay, go ahead and open your eyes. Okay, now some of you are wondering, why did we have to do this? Why, why was there like a guided meditation? Well, again, our project is called Take It Easy, which is a project that revolves around the idea of promoting mental health and relieving our stress. Faculty and staff members are target. Well, according to American Psychological Association, 61% of students see counseling for anxiety and 45% say that they are stressed. And 61% of faculty and staff members say they're stressed as well. So we thought to ourselves about what CRC needs. We thought in, that a fun way for students to relieve their stress would be through engaging in fun activities and we wanted to have events and rather than just telling them how to relieve their stress we wanted to have certain events that w they can relieve their stress upon or, hand or handing them a card which frankly can sometimes be very impersonal we wanted to have that's why we think it's important to have activities and interaction with CRC students and have something that shows to them that we care about them and project a positive image of CRC. And this is what led us to contacting an organization called Lenda Heart, Lenda Hand Animal Assisted Therapy. This organization was founded in 1987 and its purpose is to provide joy and hope to people in the Sacramento area. It provides with therapy animals. And this is what led us to, and thankfully, because of them, we were able to plan an event called Relax and Pause. 
So yes, yeah, so that is a pun, relax and pause, like a dog paw and pause. And just to let you know, the turnout of this event, we had over 70 students. And aside from 70 students, we also had faculty and staff members and professors come out and have an enjoyable time with the dogs. So Meg will play us the button again. So there's a few pictures of our event, of like students interacting. This is Brett, by the way. He's one of the team leaders from Lend to Heart, Lend to Hand. I'm gonna tell you a quick story of a gentleman that we met a few days after that event. His name was Corey. So Corey expressed his gratitude to us. He was like, oh my gosh, I didn't know there was this amazing event. I saw these dogs out on the quad and I just, I just had to take that opportunity to have fun with them. And you know, some of us, of course, why would you resist dogs, you know? But there's, there's more to that. See, Corey is not just a student here, but he was also a Marine veteran. And aside, aside from just relieving his stress, that opportunity to play with dogs, it also helped him cope with the emotional problems that he was facing in his life. Oh, sorry, one more back. <laughs> okay, so there's a gentleman right here at the top left. Um, I met him at, during the event. He was actually there from the whole time, from 12 to 2. And I was like, well, wow, do you not have class? <laughs> Of course, you know, it's, it's his break, that's what he said. But something that he mentioned to me as he was petting the dogs, and that really stuck out to me, was that, hey, this was one of the best and one of the only fun experiences that I had at CRC. Wow, the only fun experience? That's kind of sad. Okay, well, well let's, not, let's not be too negative about that, okay? Okay, so this opportunity is for us to grow. Hearing that comment, oh, the only fun, only fun. Well, if you think about it, just because we're a community college doesn't mean that we're not any different or as a four-year. There's a stigma that four-year university students say, oh, well, you're just at a two-year, you're not that stressed. Your workload's easy. You get A's all the time, it's fine. But that's not true. Who goes to our campus? Think about it. You have parents. You have people who work part-time. Like the story I told you about Corey, we have many veterans here. We have first-time students, low-income students, international students, the list goes on and on. And what does that say? Again, we're a community college serving a community, and that's our purpose, is to serve our community. It's not just here, come on April 3rd to a workshop about how to, five steps on relieving your stress and then tell them to go home. The puppies that were there, that was an opportunity to just say, hey, there's something here, I could go here, I could come here, I belong here. And you see, the future is vast. Just that puppy event is not the only thing that we could do. There are other events we can do as well. Like having an art or music day and having bi-monthly sessions where students can come together and talk about any major or minor stressors they're having in their everyday life. Or we could also have like our own designated space for a lounge area. And as we mentioned earlier, the Lend a Heart, Lend a Hand Animal Therapy Organization, they're volunteers. Um, they're willing to help at any time that we need them. And they, now that we've had this connection with CRC and Lend a Heart, they're even willing to come here every semester, every midterm season, every final season, as long as we just set an appointment with them. And again, that's all with the help of all of you, starting from the students, along with Jennifer, Nanette, Oscar, and Jordan, and those leading us in the peer mentor project. And in addition to that, also talking to the other faculty and staff and all the students who are still interested in this. If you hear a student interested in an event, reach out to them. Offer them this idea like, hey, there's an activity request form. It's easy to fill out. Let students know that this is possible to start events on their own as well. And again, we'd like to thank you all for listening into our presentation and try not to stress so much because we want all of you to take it easy. Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you for coming today. Um, we're gonna be presenting our service project. My name is Graciela Castañeda, and this is my team. Hi everyone, my name is Lexi Lopez. 
And my name is Amelia Murillo. And we are presenting to you guys Speak for Undocumented and Immigrant Rights here at CRC. So right here, we have the UC Davis mission statement. This is the original that they emailed to us. We also have a mission statement for CRC that's based on, on the UC Davis one. So it will be exactly the same, just with few changes. And it's going to, instead of saying UC Davis, it's going to say CRC. And I know plenty of you are wondering, what is SPEAK? SPEAK stands for Scholars um, Promoting Education, Awareness, and Knowledge. It established in fall 2006 at UC Davis. SPEAK is a student-led organization that supports and empowers undocumented students and students of mixed status. It establishes a safe environment where the students can have a space, safe space. But not only do we wear awareness on campus, but within the community as well. So it's called Speak, and as you see Speak, you don't know it's for undocumented or immigrants. The reason why is because UC Davis wanted to make Speak hidden from undocumented, and like he wanted to make undocumented immigrants be more like in the shadows because it was 2006. They still had fear. They still had that, you know. They didn't want to be seen. But now, 2019, they want to step in, show their campus, hey, UC Davis, I'm here. And that's what we want to do here on, camp on our campus as well. And these are some demographics that we have for, um, that we got on the internet as well. And surprisingly, there's like one out of 13 students in California are undocumented. In other words, one out of 13 students here in CRC are undocumented and we are not aware of it. So we should be more aware of it so we could help those students and bring that support for them as well. And there's 750,000 students, K through 12th grade, that have undocumented parents. That is including undocumented students, DACA students, and mixed status families. Following the demographics, we have some policies affecting our undocumented students. There's a couple of them that I want to point out directly. So we have our DACA. Most of us might have heard of it, but aren't quite familiar with it. So DACA stands for Deferred Action for Childhood um, Arrival, meaning this gives our undocumented students a work permit for two years. And that's following a bunch of steps and qualifications. And this also gives them some sort of security with immigration. The second policy I want to point out is our AB 540. Our AB 540 helps our undocumented students being able to pay in-state tuition instead of out-state tuition. I, don't, I know I don't have money to pay out tuitions. That's a lot of money. So these policies do help our undocumented students a lot, but I feel like there's still a lot of more services that need to be provided for our students. Our team's purpose. So our team has developed a partnership with UC Davis. We have monthly meetings where we d um, discuss how we're going to promote awareness throughout our campus about in undocumented students and mixed status students. And we plan to provide our students a welcoming and safe environment that has a sense of unity and family. You might be asking yourself, why do we need to speak here on our campus? Well, let me tell you all a little bit of why I believe we need to speak here on our campus through a small, short little story. So this is my third year here at CRC. And as many as you know, I myself am an undocumented student. My struggles started way before I stepped foot for the first time here at CRC. My struggles started back in high school. I thought my life was pretty much over after high school. My plans were going straight into the work field and not even attending a college. I would have a lot of CRC reps going to my high school talking about how great it was to come to college, how great it was to be a college student. They would talk about FAFSA and needing a social security. Every time I heard that word, I was like, social security? What is that? I don't have that so I must not belong at a college. That's what I thought. And then one of my high school counselors brought me into his office and was like, Graciela, listen, 
you could go to college. He helped me with my dream act, and I thought all my problems were solved. I thought I was finally going to be a college student. But no, it didn't stop there. All my classmates were getting their emails saying they were finally a college student and they could start enrolling in classes. But what did I get? I got an email telling me my application was on hold because I wasn't a resident. There was still another step for me. I had to go through the AB 540 application process. Every time I would go to admissions, the lady that was supposed to help me, the only one that was able to help me, was never there. That made the process 10 times harder, my struggles 10 times harder. I kept pursuing, I kept pushing, and I had no one in my corner, no one to help me. It was just me. My parents were clueless. They had no idea how college worked. I had no idea how it worked. I finally was able to call myself a college student, but my struggles didn't stop there. My struggles continue until this day. And I strongly believe enough should be enough. And that's why we need to speak on our campus, to have our students, our undocumented students, be able to get that help, the help that I wasn't able to get. So the current support that we have here on campus is the CRC Dream Center that was recently established not too long ago, as well as our faculty advisor, Juana Esti, and also we have the support of other faculty and staff on CRC campus and mostly we have the support of UC Davis Speak which is helping us in anything we need any support that we need which problems that my face we might face as well so how we plan to implement it on our campus is obviously establishing a club we currently have 16 members and growing and we plan to maintain a supportive and encouraged environment by hosting consistent club meetings and club events. We plan to provide team building to maintain a close bond and family unit within our club. We also plan to work alongside the Dream Center by hosting and organizing events and bringing more awareness on our campus, along with having a um, undocumented training established for our club leadership positions to help bring more awareness and understanding how we can help our club members. As you might have heard with all of the previous um, service projects, our biggest concern is room. We have very limitation on growth. Uh, finding that room, that space for us, will always be hard, not just for us, but for every other service project being worked on. I feel like for our service project to be able to fulfill its potential and grow, we do need that space. And I can't stress that enough. Without that space, our undocumented students, just all of our students, won't be able to find that place to call theirs, their safe space. We also, as of right now, as many know, we don't have a full-time staff in our Dream Center. And that, to me, is one of our biggest problems. We don't have a staff that has all its time committed to the Dream Center and to be able to help all of our undocumented and mixed status students. That's one of our biggest, biggest problems right now. So moving forward, to make this plan successful, we, we plan to support from everybody by establishing an ally training from faculty, staff, and students to help them gain a better understanding and support be able to support our, the need of our students, along with be, having, being determined to provide a safe space and dedicated staff by creating a safe environment, open dialogue, and support from our staff and counselors. And we want to make sure that it's not just the Latinx community, but it's open to all. And we truly want to emphasize that together, together we, we could be, be the, the change. change. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sahil Kasi couldn't make it today. She came down with an illness last night, and she was trying to make it today, but couldn't make it. But really briefly, some of you might have heard of the uh, of Unity Day that happened exactly a week ago, and that was a very successful event. 
And I'm just going to briefly uh, talk about the event. And something that, you know, Sahil uh, is, feels really strongly about. Um, so this day was a day that brought in people from different faith, uh, different ways of life. And uh, it was led by um, the keynote speaker, Rowdy Duncan. He's a, a you know, renowned blogger, and he has a podcast about, about inclusivity. And it was a very powerful event. Some of you here attended that event. And it's something that she plans to implement next year as well. She's already, think, she's already thinking about what's happening next year. And uh, that's one of the, she's uh, very uh, inspiring. I didn't know this, but this is her first job ever. If you see her, you wouldn't think that way. And she's dynamic. And one thing that she, ha she actually did is she created a, a, a work group with faculty, staff, and other students. That's the only student that went... I, I, I play around with her, I tell her she went rogue, and she went on her own, and uh, she created this, this um, work group, and it was uh, extremely, extremely impactful. So I just want to give a little brief background about the event. Um, and I wouldn't do it justice like she did, so I'm not going to attempt to it. So, um, so we're going to go ahead and, and, and hear from the next uh, presenters. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Anastasia Dobson Bell, and I'm, I'm here with my colleagues uh, with our CRC media team uh, Chris Adams, June Lee, and Wilhelmina Wade. And uh, we're here to talk with you today about our film project, which is called Hawk Talks, and uh, what we are doing with it, and uh, what our goal with this project is as well. So, uh, do a little backstory. So, uh, my first year as a peer mentor was in uh, the fall of 2017 and I was working with several mentees and as I was talking with them and getting to know them a little bit more, I asked them, what, what is your experience like here? You know, what, are you able to find resources and get involved? And many of them expressed to me that they felt unsupported, uh, they felt unmotivated, they had troubling, con trouble connecting with other students, um, they felt apprehension about approaching their professors and overall just not feeling that they belonged here on campus. Um, that it's just pretty much a, a stop along the way to a four-year university or a job and that's just pretty much it. And uh, I could relate to that because when I started college, I felt completely lost and scared and I didn't know who to turn to or who to talk to to feel that I could move forward. Um, frankly, I felt like nobody really cared. And the students that I was working with expressed very similar sentiments. So I began to wonder, what do we need to do to meet them where they are? What do we need to say or, or have them see to feel comfortable and welcomed here on this campus? And so by January of 2018, Hawk Talks was born. Okay, so our mission is to break the barrier between the new students and our returning students by um, our, our new students and our, um, and our returning students and the um, community by exposing our culture on CERC's campus to the students and let them also get familiar with the faculty and the staff and the community by, um, through, we're doing this through the media, the um, multimedia. And um, that, so before they actually step on campus, so that they'll feel more comfortable with coming here. Hello, can you hear me? Perfect. Okay, what do we do? What do we do here uh, with our interviews? Um, we really um, try to make students uh, successful as they can be. Uh, we have a lot of resources. I know you guys can read, I hope you guys can read this up here, but it says here provide helpful tips, advice, and all those things. But for me, it's really uh, introducing the viewer into the person behind the title. And when I say the person behind the title, I mean whether you're a student, a faculty member, 
or administrator, or anything in that nature, um, a lot of students don't know what it's like here on campus. They have no clue. All they know is rate my professor and maybe they may read some things here and there on the website. For me, I'm a visual learner, so show me. You know, we don't have a lot of things uh, here on campus that actually show our students what it's actually like. And in our videos, we have, uh, you know, faculty members, uh, students telling how, how they struggle through uh, different things, how they change majors, just the things that you will be going through uh, throughout your uh, time being here at CRC. Um, uh, the, the people who came in before uh, the different groups here uh, shared with you uh, their experiences here, and that's really what we want to show other students, uh, that everybody goes through something different. We're a diverse uh, group here, and we all have our struggles, but if somebody else could do it, maybe you'll be able to do it, or maybe they could show you, um, show you how it's done or show you where to go. So basically, our interviews are just going in, uh, talking to students, faculty members, just about them, just having a normal conversation. That way we don't look at the suit, we don't look at the person and judge, we could actually go there, click on the site, click the person, and see exactly what it is for ourselves. So our, so our goal here is to achieve a, uh, is to create, sorry, is to create a community that's uh, supportive, where um, students f uh, feel belong even before they arrive on campus. By having this uh, interview with, uh, with people from the campus, instead of just thinking or like thinking or imagining what, it's, what it would be like uh, get coming into CRC, you can actually build this connection with the, with the people by seeing them and seeing them talk. And we hope that that would get incoming students feel more familiar with the uh, campus and f more uh, comfortable before they arrive. So that after they get here, they can, you know, they will be willing to connect with other students, connect with their professors, especially professors, because uh, in an academic standpoint, it's very important to build a cohesive and really like strong relationship with your uh, instructors so that you can get their support and get, you know, get their, um, their recommendation letters, for example, when you are you're pursuing something outside of school. Also, uh, if students are more informed about the resources on our campuses, like all our service projects, after they come in here, um, if they have any other um, problems they're, uh, they're, they're like seeing in their lives, they can just uh, go to different resources and, and get their services. And that's very important to, for them to have a successful education, uh, uh, education career. Thank you. And so we just have a short clip for you all to watch just as an example of the, a couple of interviews that we've done and to give you a general feel of uh, what we have already on our channel. Sorry. Oscar Mendoza Plasencia and my job title is a, a Student Success and Support Program Specialist. My name is Dr. Colette Harris-Matthews. I'm the Dean of Communication, Visual and Performing Arts at Casamos River College. I've been at the college for 15 years. My name is uh, Jun Long Lee, and uh, everybody call me June, and uh, my major is uh, Mechanical Engineering. A peer mentoring program, in a sense, is uh, peer-led um, support. Um, on this campus and many campuses, uh, we try our best to provide students with faculty support, uh, with uh, you know, um, counseling support and uh, uh, staff support but our students tend to um, receive the information better from their own peers. So this is a, an effort for us to support our students and with, uh, with the assistance of their own peers. I went to Sacramento State University and um, my first year was really a trial and error. Even though my father had attended college, uh, and he actually attended Sac State, but it had been a very long time in between. Uh, and I consistently saw a counselor. I wanted to be done in four years, and 
didn't want to take classes that I didn't and that didn't meet my major. I started out as a criminal justice major. I was hoping to go to college and be a criminal defense attorney, and that was my my big uh, desire. But uh, my first criminal justice class consisted of a smoking man um, with his foot on the desk, um, telling us we were going to go to the prison as a um, as a field trip. And I was like, oh, I didn't really sign up, <laughs> sign up for that. But um, my first year. I, I did okay, but I struggled through uh, college composition. Um, I felt that I wasn't prepared in terms of the literature we read, um, literature that I was like, okay, I remembered reading it in, in high school, but it, it, it seemed um, the questions that were being asked were far more in depth. And then I also struggled with um, the, the vocabulary. Uh, I remember a sociology professor that <laughs> I swore wasn't speaking English, so I always wrote down the words in the margin and went home and looked them up later. But but I made it through, but it was more, um, I, I felt that I had to guide myself a lot through the first year, but I made it. <laughs> Don't be afraid to fail, really to, I mean, be confident knowing that you can achieve uh, the stuff that you, you can achieve your goal as long as you put your mind to it. But know that you will fail, but don't be afraid to fail because you have to experience, experience as much as you can, then you'll learn from it, even if you fail. And on behalf of Hawk Talk Media, we would like to thank everybody who participated in helping and developing this project. And thank you all for coming to listen. OK, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jose Alcantara, and uh, this is my carnal. Alejandro Anguiano. And you will learn why I address him as such. Um, now, before we get started, I want to introduce, um, well, actually, we're going to begin with the story of how this program began, and Alejandro's going to guide us through that. So, uh, a year and a half ago, I had the opportunity to be on a panel at Sac State, and while being on that panel, I saw uh, one of the other panelists with this logo right here. And this logo uh, meant a lot to me because that's for my culture and my ancestors. After the panel was over, I went up to him and I was like, what is, what is this? What does this mean? And he, uh, and he began to tell me and he gave me the acronym, what is CARNAL? So CARNAL is Korean Academic Readiness Network for Aspiring Latinos. And he ended it with the brotherhood. And I was like, brotherhood, what, is, what does that mean? Give me more, what is that, what is that? And so I gr literally grabbed him and I went up to Oscar and I said, Oscar, we need this on our campus. I'm Latino and I'm trying to graduate. And how do we begin by doing that? And so that's when I jumped on board after uh, Alejandro and Oscar had already like kind of had this plan in mind. Uh, I jumped on and I wanted to make a difference. It was something that we were all really passionate about. So it was something we had in common. And as you can see, we are, all three of us are Latino males. So I think that it was really interesting. Uh, we could definitely see the need and the struggle that Latino males go through, especially in higher education. And so before we got started uh, to bring that to CRC, we kind of did some research. Um, and we found two very, I want to say a little bit devastating statistics because one of the first things that we ran into was how difficult it is to find positive statistics for Latino males. Because if you look up Latino males, chances are you're going to find incarceration rates, dropout rates, and uh, things of that nature. And we feel that it's time to make a difference and it definitely served as an indication that this is an issue much bigger and greater than ourselves and we hope to contribute to that. Um, as you can see here, one of the first things that I noticed was how we compare culturally to other um, cultures in higher education because we, as you can see, uh, Latino males as of 2014, 20% have earned an associate degree or higher. But when we compare that to Asians, they're at 62%. When we compare that to whites, they're at 45%. And when we compare to African Americans, they're at 30%. So what this data is showing is that there is a need for Latinos to succeed academically, both in the classroom and outside of it. 
So while we were reading and uh, researching the statistics, uh, Jose had the great idea of um, saying, hey, Alejandro, would you like to take two history classes during the summer of last year? And I was like, what? And so that's when our journey began to uh, understanding what is uh, really going to be Carnal, setting the foundation. So we took these two uh, history classes on online, which I've never took, and one in the classroom. And I said, okay, Jose, if we're going to do this, you're going to be here with me all the way. And mind you, during the process, that was the first time Jose ever finished all his homework. He true, never missed an assignment. True. It was one, two, or three in the morning, and we were doing our homework. We understood that if we're going to do this, if we're going to succeed, we have to trust each other. And our culture, masculinity rules. This idea of what it is to be a man, what it is to ask for help. And that's one of the things we learned through this process, being able to ask for help. And how do we bring those barriers down? Because ultimately, our families don't understand the institutions. They understand you get our work and you got to bring money home. That's all. They value education, but they don't understand it. So how can you understand something you don't know of? Yeah, and so moving forth, one of the biggest questions we get is why we're so predicated around Latino males and their success uh, and why we're not including females, all right? And so our, st our second statistic here will kind of address that, and that's because when we compare to our counter female or female counterpart, they're actually um, academically succeeding more than us Latino males. And as you can see, while that increase is only by 5%, those are statistics that are growing annually. Um, this data was of, as of 2014, um, but furthermore, that's nationally. So we have to keep that into account when we think of 5%. So at this point, <clears throat> kind of as Alejandro mentioned, we had already established this connection. We felt we were ready to really bring this to CRC. Uh, you know, he had mentioned that he met with the other program and it was already an established program. After our summer experience, we felt that we really bonded and created that foundation. and We wanted to spread it out to other students that we felt could use these sort of programs. And so, in essence, what I want to do is just summarize what our purpose is, put in the most basic form. And so our purpose is to meet the needs of our Latino male student population while embodying the principles of academic excellence, culture, and brotherhood. And I think we've done just that. So, uh, one of our initial steps to bring this program to CRC, um, as Alejandro mentioned, this is a program that's actually already existing at another institution. Um, and we had the pleasure of meeting with them, which was really cool. They were kind enough to actually come down here um, from Chabot Community College. And uh, that's actually where the logo comes from. So they, uh, that's actually their logo, which as you can see, we also use. And you can see they have the shirts. Theirs are black, but again, same concept. And it was really great because we were able to develop a foundation for a program and get a lot of tips and advice of what we can expect in the near future and how to go about it. So this is one of our big events that we had was Latino Mentoring Night. And this was a, 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 an event that we had were able to bring Latinos from the outside who were already professionals and collaborate with students. And this was a night to have dinner to talk about our successes, our, our failures, or whatnot. But the most beautiful thing that was at this event, we saw folks that looked like us, that represented us, that said, this is a struggle, but this is your journey, whatever that looks like. And to be able to hear that and understand that and be able to see, even Dr. Bush, his inspiration, he, I, we understood that this is bigger than ourselves. Yeah, and it was really cool because for once it was like these students could see professionals and they can envision themselves in these positions, both in higher education and in the professional workforce fields. So where that led us is to basically present day. Um, we decided to go the club route, so we're officially a club on campus. We aim to meet twice a month. I should say we are meeting twice a month. Um, and we also want to make sure that we bond outside of school because the purpose of this is not just academic and professional development, but it's also to make sure that everyone has a sense of belonging because as I'm sure many of you know, first generation students, it's very difficult for parents or relatives or anyone really to understand what the daily life is like in higher education and we want to form a space where students can connect and know that everyone in this space knows exactly what you're going through 
Um, and then we also have an interest to expand into high schools, dude. Yes, so Delta High School is one of the, our high school, our local high school, and we want to be able to bring their Latino uh, male students into CRC, get, get a, a sense of what it is to be in community college and be able to go into a four-year institution by recognizing who is on our campus, that these are the people that look like you, can talk like you, and understand your struggle. And by doing that, we're able to, now when another individual goes and Googles Latino students in higher education, they're going to see that CRC is stepping up on that game. And so that high school actually reached out to us and they would like us to, at some point, create a sort of pipeline that would guide these high school students into our community college and potentially in the future onto four-year institutions as well. Now what this will do is make sure that students feel like they belong on this campus the minute they get here because they'll have familiar faces, they'll know that there are advocates for them that will look out for both their needs and concerns on and off the campus as well. Um, we want to implement, again, we want to promote professional growth and development. And so that's kind of why we're dressed the way we are. We plan to make sure that at these meetings, we, wanna, we want the students to dress up and have a sense of mutual respect and practice our professional selves. We also plan to do campus and industry tours, both of which will help students visualize themselves succeeding in different academic and professional levels. And we also want to implement academic progress reports. We're actually working with a professor, a professor Peshkov, and his role in this program is to um, focus around academics. He wants to bring in progress reports like the ones from EOPS or FYE, and that way if any student is struggling, we can see what it is they need and how we can help them. Um, we also want to do fundraising because those are opportunities to grow leadership and development skills. And more than anything, increase membership as well. Call to action. All right, so as you know, there's something that's already started, um, but I think that a lot of us are not aware, or at least I know that a lot of people I've met were not aware of the statistics and the severity and the importance of the matter. So I think that that's one thing we can all do is really understand where this program's coming from and the need for it. We can encourage faculty and staff to take part in our events. As you know, the Latino Male Mentoring Night turned out really, really well. Um, there was a good amount of people, but that doesn't mean that there's not a room for growth. And so I invite you to join us and empower our students. Also, um, I, we would like to see more leadership opportunities for Latino males. Um, one such example, tomorrow we're actually attending a conference uh, for race and ethnicity in Chico. Um, and those are the kind of things that I think empower students because I know both of us have gone on conferences um, that were predicated around race and ethnicity. And had it not been for that, I don't think I'd be up here leading projects like this. It re made me realize what my purpose is, and it made me realize that I have the power to make a difference in other students and people's lives. And with that being said, thank you for each and every one of you for being here. And this project has means so much to us because this upcoming uh, May, me and uh, Jose will be graduating. Uh, we'll be the first one in our founders to be graduating. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. As you can tell, they're very passionate about their projects because hopefully it's clear, but they you know, identify with each one of their projects. And I could not be any more proud. You know, I'm uh, uh, up here just listening to what they're, they're, they, they accomplished and what they're, they, they can accomplish in the future even, even more. So I'm just excited. You know, I love working. I love coming every day. And this is why I love coming every day. And this is why I do what I do. Why we do what we do, right? Because this is not just me. I have a great team. You know, even though they didn't know they were going to be part of this team, kind of went and asked them for help one day, and I never let them go. So thank you, uh, Nanette. Thank you, Jennifer. And I don't think they knew what they were signing up for, because I signed them up for that, too. So um, with that, I want to do something really quick. Uh, Jose and Alejandro alluded to this. There's a few graduates. So I do want to recognize those graduates, right? Because it's not easy. Someone mentioned earlier that just because you come into community college doesn't mean the work's any less, right? So it is college. Community college is college. And you guys are making it. So I want to call upon some of the graduates so we can come up here and get a little certificate from us. So, all right. So Abigail. Alejandro Anguiano. 
Anastasia Dobson Bell, <laughs> Chi Wen, Chris Adams, <laughs> Freddie Mandy, Jose Alcantara, June Lee, Militia Blakes, and Sonia Lessa. And uh, while they're coming up, I have another one right here. This is a little different. You know, if it was, uh, and it's a little special, it's even more special. Let me tell you why. When I started this peer mentor, actually before I started the, this peer mentor, you know, uh, I met this young man. And uh, when I met him, he was a little broken, physically and emotionally, right? And because uh, he had a broken leg right then. What was it, Yuenko? It was something was broken then. So I bumped into him on the quad, and just by mere coincidence, it was me and Khalid making our normal walks. He started talking to him, and then, you know, one thing led to another. We invited him to FYE, and then once his grades got better, I hired him, and then now he's at Sac State, and uh, I want to say that he's graduating next month with a degree in accounting. So. You can come up here, Lazaro. He's, by the way, our first peer mentor graduating with his bachelor's degree. So, all right. So, if you say what, if you ask why I come every day, this is why I come every day. All right. Thank you very much. I really appreciate all the work you do. You're awesome. Oh, thank you.